Good afternoon, and welcome to I'm Unique, Just Like You, Human Side Channels and Their Implications for Security and Privacy. You're in Lagoon H uh, GHI, and our speaker is Matt Wixey. But before we begin, we have a few brief notes. Uh, stop by the business hall located in Mandalay Bay, Oceanside, and Shoreline Ballrooms on level two during the day and for the welcome reception at 5.30 this evening. The Black Hat Arsenal is in the business hall on level two. And join us for the Pony Awards in Lagoon JKL at 6.30. Um, after the talk, there's going to be, a, if you have questions and it goes over, the wrap room is going to be in Reef A. And um, please put your phones on silent and be respectful of that. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming. So this is I'm Unique, just like you. Um, just a quick note that all the references in the slide deck are at the end of the deck itself, and the deck will be published on the Black Hat website uh, at about 6 p.m. this evening, I think. So my name is Matt Wixey. Uh, I lead security research for PwC UK cybersecurity practice. I'm also a part-time PhD student at University College London, although not on uh, this topic. Um, prior to joining PwC, I worked in law enforcement in London, uh, again doing cybersecurity R&D. Uh, and I've spoken at uh, various other security cons, including uh, Black Hat. So thank you, Black Hat, for having me back. Um, so aims for this talk, uh, I'm going to cover three human side channels and how they work. I'm going to talk about practical takeaways for each one of those, including some tools that you can uh, download and play with pretty much straight away. Uh, I'm going to talk about implications for security and privacy of those three side channels, talk about possible countermeasures from a privacy perspective, and then explore some ideas for future research as well. So I'm going to give you a brief bit of background, uh, then we'll go on to the three side channels, which are forensic linguistics, behavioral signatures, and cultural captures, uh, and then I'll wrap up at the end. So I want to start with a story. Uh, anyone familiar with um, John Christie or has heard of him before? Okay, um, so uh, this is a really interesting story. So uh, in 1949, a guy called Timothy Evans walked into a police station in Wales, uh, very far from where he lived in London. And uh, he told the police that his wife had died. Uh, the police officers interviewed him. And as a result of uh, what came out of that interview uh, and those statements, Timothy Evans was arrested uh, for the murder of his wife. He was found guilty and he was executed in 1950. Uh, in, uh, some years later, a linguist called Jan Svartvik analyzed the statements that Evans had given to police. And those statements were supposed to be uh, word for word verbatim transcripts of, uh, of what Evans had said. Uh, Svartvik was able to distinguish two different writing styles in those statements. Uh, one of them was Evans, and the other one uh, was the, uh, that of the police officers, particularly in incriminating passages. Uh, and further investigation and a public inquiry eventually led to the posthumous pardon of Timothy Evans. And um, this man, John Christie, was the man who'd actually murdered Timothy Evans' wife. Uh, he was a, a serial killer in the 40s and 50s. So um, not the most uplifting story, um, but it does uh, illustrate some of what I'm going to talk about today in terms of uh, authorial voices and styles of behavior and that kind of thing. So uh, some background on this. So if you're an investigator and you're trying to find out who's uh, committed a real world crime, there are various bits of evidence you can use. Things like DNA, fingerprints, uh, gait analysis, so walking style, uh, voice analysis, that kind of thing. Unique identifiers that are kind of biometric in nature. With digital offenses, there are some kinds of equivalents um, with some kind of caveats, so not necessarily kind of unique, depends on the context. Things like IP and MAC addresses, uh, subscriber info, that sort of thing. The issue with those is uh, that they're also kind of the easiest identifiers to obfuscate or spoof or anonymize. So people have looked at kind of other uh, attribution techniques. Unfortunately, they tend to take us further away from the individual. So for example, uh, a popular one is trying to correlate attack activity to a particular time zone, which can take you to a particular region of the world, um, but will take you kind of further away from the individual. The stuff in this talk is very much about the individual um, at that level. So um, thinking about things slightly differently in terms of kind of attribution and defense, uh, computers have side channels. They have kind of unintentional leakage and primitive outputs, things like light and sound and electromagnetic radiation uh, as a result of the things they do. And if you kind of consider humans as, as uh, biocomputers, uh, if you like, 
uh, we have our own outputs. We have writing and speech and uh, typing behaviors and that sort of thing. And we also have unintentional leakage. Um, personality psychology theory and behavioral theory uh, talks about distinctive yet consistent elements to our behavior, uh, which come about as a result of the fact that we've all got unique uh, educations and experiences and uh, ways of looking at the world. And as a result, embedded in those outputs are potentially kind of identifying features and information um, that can be used to, uh, to distinguish us um, from each other. And that's what I mean by the term human side channels. So uh, I'll start with talking about uh, forensic linguistics. Now, um, my first degree, uh, my bachelor's degree, was in English language and literature. And this is how I kind of became interested in linguistics. I was interested at first in etymology. And this is uh, from a real, real email that I sent to my professor because I wanted to do an essay on the etymology of the, word, of the F word. Um, and this was his response. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, uh, very encouraging. Um, and that's kind of um, how I got interested in linguistics, first etymology and then kind of uh, linguistics. And then because I worked in law enforcement, I became interested in forensic linguistics as well. So forensic linguistics um, started with Jan Svartvik um, when he published a paper on the John Christie case in 1968. Um, he never really took it any further. He went back to his day job, but since then other academics kind of took it up. And uh, it probably matured as a discipline around kind of the 1990s and it's developed since then. One particularly interesting aspect of forensic linguistics is authorship attribution via something called stylometry, which is essentially kind of analysis of writing style. And it's based on these five things, on spelling and orthography, so the kind of rules of language, grammar, uh, lexicon or vocabulary, idiom, so kind of unique ways of, um, uh, of expressing yourself and, and kind of identical expressions across multiple pieces of text. So it's essentially trying to find out if you have a piece of text and you don't know who the author is, can you, by comparing that text, to other texts, try and work out uh, which author might have written it. So in the real world, it's used in law enforcement. Um, it's uh, used to analyze things like ransom notes and text messages. Um, it's used in investigations for plagiarism in academia. Uh, it's been used in literature to try and work out who wrote Shakespeare's plays, if it was Shakespeare or someone else. Uh, same with the Federalist Papers. Uh, same with uh, J.K. Rowling's first um, post-Harry Potter book. It was used to, she wrote it under a pseudonym. So forensic linguistics was used to kind of attribute that to her. And as with the uh, John Christie case, uncovering miscarriages of justice as well. What forensic linguistics isn't is detection of deception. Uh, so that's a different kind of sub-discipline. Uh, Van der Zee and others uh, last year did an amazing piece of work on this uh, where they analyzed the tweets of a very well-known American politician who's known to tweet a lot and uh, wanted to see if they could work out using kind of ground truth from his tweets whether or not he was lying. Um, my talk at Black Hat last year was on a similar kind of thing around social engineering and phishing. Um, so picking out kind of features in, in writing that could be used to see if someone's lying. Uh, forensic linguistics isn't detecting what someone means uh, by a piece of text or kind of trying to interpret the content in any way. Uh, it's not about textual fingerprints. Um, that's kind of a common misconception. And it's also not handwriting analysis, which again is a, a separate discipline. So in terms of techniques uh, to do it, uh, to do stylometry, it ranges from the very complex to the pretty basic. Complex techniques, essentially you create a corpus, a repository or a database of pieces of text. Uh, you extract features of interest, which could be things like average sentence length, average word length, use of pronouns and function words, uh, unique words in a text. And then you statistically compare those features to features in another piece of text. Uh, historically, that was done manually. Um, then it was done with um, uh, computational statistics. And nowadays, it's done with machine learning. Uh, support vector machines is the, uh, one of the most common approaches. But on the basic level, and this is something I really want to try and get across in this talk, um, there's a lot you can do with forensic linguistics without having to have this academic background in it, without having to know about machine learning or statistics. Um, there's actually kind of uh, quite a lot you can do with it. So uh, a really effective technique can just be looking at a piece of text um, and observing, noting unusual spellings and punctuation, and then either searching for those within a corpus or just on a search engine to see where else that turns up. So some case studies from the real world. Uh, these are taken from a book called Word Crime by John Olson, which is worth a read. Um, so John Olson is a, a full-time forensic linguist. Uh, on the left, you've got uh, a woman called Julie Turner, uh, who was murdered in uh, Yorkshire in the UK in 2005. And um, after her disappearance, text messages were sent from her phone, um, basically telling friends and family that she was disappearing because she needed to sort her head out and sort her life out. 
uh, one of the suspects in that investigation, who was the man, uh, the man with whom Julie Turner was having an affair, was interviewed by the police and used those exact same phrases uh, in that interview that he needed to sort his head out and sort his life out. Using that as a starting point, uh, that man was uh, then arrested and found guilty of Julie Turner's murder. So an example of just how um, simple phrases like that can be used, and part of that investigation was searching for those phrases in sequence in things like uh, corpuses to see uh, if they turned up anywhere else, how kind of unusual they were. On the right, you've got two men from Scotland who were arrested for murder in the 1980s in um, something called the Ice Cream Wars, uh, which was a, a drug uh, and gang war in Scotland. Um, and uh, this was an example of a miscarriage of justice. So um, four police officers claimed that they'd heard a specific sentence uh, from these suspects sometime after it had allegedly been uttered. Uh, and it was later found that it's basically kind of impossible to, um, to recollect exactly what someone has said time, uh, sometime after it's happened, uh, not least the fact that four individuals claim to have done it. In terms of kind of uh, case studies which are specific to cybersecurity, um, the majority of work has been uh, done in academia. Um, there aren't many practical examples, which again is something that I hope this talk might um, uh, might change. Um, but in terms of uh, academic research, there's been a lot of stuff on trying to attribute um, separate uh, uh, tweets and Twitter accounts and sock puppets online, so accounts that are run under different names operated by the same person, which obviously is kind of quite an important um, social thing at the moment. Um, things like extremist forum posts and emails. Uh, source code is a really interesting sub-discipline, so Kaliskan, Islam and others have done some amazing work on seeing whether they can de-anonymize programmers based on source code and even on uh, artifacts from compiled binaries, which obviously has a, uh, a lot of implications for malware analysis. Uh, and finally, kind of authorship deception, so cases where people have deliberately tried to imitate the writing styles of, of other people. Uh, and I'll talk about that a bit later. In terms of uh, practical hands-on case studies, um, one of the most interesting is Operation Tripoli, which was a piece of checkpoint research uh, only uh, last month or the month before. They found a, a large-scale Facebook social engineering campaign where a fake profile had been set up and through uh, links was trying to induce people to click on those links and then get infected with malware. By searching for certain spelling mistakes and grammatical mistakes um, in, uh, I believe it was Arabic, um, they were able to identify other profiles that they believe were run by the same threat actor, so massively expanded that investigation. Judith Tebron in 2016 gave a black hat talk on uh, forensic linguistics applied to phone scams and certain things that can be used to identify phone scammers. Um, and then Gucci for 2.0 is a really interesting example, a really kind of niche uh, sub-discipline of forensic linguistics where someone from one country pretends to be speaking in the language of another country or pretends to be kind of originating from that country. Some other use cases that uh, you could use forensic linguistics for would be spear phishing. So if you have um, spear phishing emails that have different pretexts that have been sent to different organizations um, and you want to see kind of how similar they are to maybe others that you've got in a database or a repository, you could use forensic linguistics. Uh, similarly for kind of missives and manifestos on things like Pastebin, uh, ransomware instructions, I know those tend to be kind of quite boilerplate and just from templates, but there are examples of where they contain potentially unique content. Um, if you've got posts or tweets that, that are coordinating things like DDoS attacks in real time, um, and then potentially you could use it to identify Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, I'd be surprised if that hasn't been done already. Um, because there's quite a lot of content that Nakamoto posted along with his kind of white paper in 2008. Also lots of forum posts up until he, he disappeared off the grid in 2011. Um, but potentially you could use it for something like that. So I'm going to run through some tools. Um, and these are um, all open source. Uh, these are all available for download. They're all free. Um, they've got kind of... A, Advantages and disadvantages, and I'll kind of run through some of those. The first is JGAP, uh, so this is on GitHub. Um, this is a Java application. Uh, it's got a lot of features. It's pretty complex, and there's, there's a, a fairly steep learning curve for this one, so maybe not the best one to start off with. Um, and the output's also a little bit hard to interpret, but you can kind of download it, have a play with it. Um, Delta spreadsheets, um, so... I know I have a room full of security professionals here and I'm telling you to download a spreadsheet and enable macros, um, but um, 
This one uh, uses a very simple forensic linguistics technique. Um, as you can see from the spreadsheet, uh, this does require kind of manual data entry um, and enabling macros in the output. Once you get used to the output, it's not too easy to, um, uh, it's not too hard, sorry, to decipher. Uh, stylometry, um, so this is a, a standalone GitHub repository. Um, it's a collection of Python scripts. Um, and as you can see on this uh, graph on the right-hand side here, uh, what you've got is uh, an analysis of certain famous um, novels and plays, and it's kind of grouped them together according to how similar they are. Uh, this is my favorite one, so this is Stylo. Stylo is a library for the uh, statistics package R, um, which some of you uh, may have used before. If you haven't, um, R has quite a steep learning curve by itself, but Stylo doesn't, which is really nice. So there's only about kind of four or five commands you need to know to use Stylo. Uh, it's got a really nice graphical interface, and again, gives you kind of graphical outputs. Um, various analysis methods that you can use as well. I don't want to kind of, as you can probably tell, I haven't gone into too much detail around uh, the actual analysis methods used in forensic linguistics, um, but that's something you could kind of explore here as well. And then Shiloh, um, Shiloh is a wrapper for Stylo, so it means you can run uh, Stylo within a browser instead of having to use R. Um, very kind of easy to use interface, um, point and click, and as you can see, it gives you some nice output. So what you've got here is a, a kind of network diagram where I've put some text in, um, and these texts are kind of chapters from uh, famous novels and plays. And uh, just taking you through this on the top right, you've got excerpts from Romeo and Juliet and Hamlet. So you can see that Shiloh has analyzed those and found that they probably have an author in common, i.e. Shakespeare, because they're very similar. And then you've got uh, examples from War and Peace, which all clustered together, um, Pride and Prejudice clustered together, and so on and so on. So um, this is an example with some, um, some real data, so not kind of um, literature stuff. Um, this is blog articles from the PwC website. And I took three blog articles that I'd written and then three articles that two of my colleagues had each written and compared these to see how similar uh, they are. And in terms of kind of using this on a day-to-day -day basis, what you might do is you might have kind of a load of spear phishing emails that you think or you know have been sent by threat actor A, and uh, another set that you think or know have been written by threat actor B, and you've got a new one come in and you want to see which one it's most similar to, you could use something like this. So you can see that my blog articles are, are clustered uh, fairly closely together, um, but distinct from each of my colleagues um, who are also distinct from each other. So just a, a summary of the trade-offs of these tools, including things like the scalability, how easy they are to use, and that sort of thing. Um, but definitely download these, have a play with them, and see what you think. Uh, there are some caveats with using forensic linguistics for things like threat intelligence and incident response. Uh, the first is that register makes a big difference. So in linguistics, register is uh, the audience you're writing for and the kind of context you're writing in. Um, and I'll give an example in the next slide. Um, you do need a baseline of text, so you need kind of fairly decent sample sizes. Um, so if you've got three tweets, for example, that's probably not going to do it. You're not going to get kind of decent results. Um, the exact kind of strategy you take um, would be uh, depend on your circumstances. So you might not need a corpus if you're kind of doing, taking the approach where you're just looking for unusual spellings or turns of phrase and you're just searching for those on Google, um, then you could just go ahead and do that without needing any of these tools necessarily. Uh, time lapse might affect results. So uh, whilst personality psychology tells us that people act in con uh, consistent, distinctive ways, that can change over time as we kind of develop styles and things like that. And again, just to reiterate, this isn't kind of a silver bullet. It's not 100% accurate, um, but it could be of investigative value. So here's an example of a, a register and the kind of caveat around this. So on the left, you've got a chart, a, a comparison chart of um, some chapters from 1984 by George Orwell. And you can see that most of them are clustered together on the right because they're fairly similar, but you've got two big uh, outliers there. And um, the reason those are outliers is, is really interesting. So um, if you haven't read 1984, there's a, a bit in it where Winston Smith, the main character, is reading a book um, by a guy called Emmanuel Goldstein. So it's kind of a book within a book. Um, and for that chapter or chapter and a half, uh, we're reading that that text. So Orwell was kind of adopting a different authorial style and a different authorial voice. And as a result, um, that particular chapter appears as an, an outlier here. Um, the one on the top is a later chapter in 1984 where um, most of the chapter is a character speaking. Um, so because it's a different style, um, that again is an outlier. 
On the right, uh, you've got my blog articles, um, which are clustered together in the bottom left, compared to uh, some short stories that I've written. So you can see that they are kind of all over the place because they have different styles, different genres. Um, they might be written in first person or third person, whereas my blog articles adopt a kind of consistent style. So that will have some impact. So to put that in kind of real terms, comparing a load of tweets to uh, spear phishing emails, for instance, won't necessarily uh, be of any value. Privacy implications of forensic linguistics. So obviously there are kind of very valid, legitimate reasons why someone might want to write something uh, and be anonymous when they're doing it. Um, and forensic linguistics can be used to try and diminish that anonymity uh, through something called adversarial stylometry. So countermeasures for that um, include trying to deliberately disguise your writing style. That can either be by imitating someone else's style, either during or after writing. Um, something that gets suggested a lot is running text through Google Translate, um, so running it through 12 times in different languages. Um, you kind of have to do a lot of work to try and restore the original meaning of what it is you were trying to say, um, but that, that potentially could work. There has also been some work on trying to um, evade adversarial stylometry. So Anonymouth is probably uh, a really good example of that. It's a little bit old now. You can still download the tool, um, but you have to kind of mess around with the code to get it to work. But basically what Anonymouth does is it takes um, a kind of small corpus of text that you've written and uh, the text that you want to be anonymous and it compares the two to see how easily they can be linked together um, and picks out certain features that you might want to, to change. So in terms of what you can do now in terms of practical knowledge uh, with this particular uh, side channel is test these tools out, build um, you know, some uh, corpus of um, previous attack data, open source data, whether that's tweets or paste bin stuff or whatever, test the tools out, let me know what you think, if they work, if it could kind of be a viable approach for some of your threat intel or uh, incident response work and maybe some other context that it could be used in as well. Okay, uh, so moving on to the next bit, behavioral signatures. Um, I'm really proud of this joke, but it, it never gets a good laugh um, because it's aimed at a very, very niche target audience, which is statisticians who are also Jay-Z fans. Um, uh, it's a very small group. Maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. Um, so behavioral signatures. Um, so a really active area of research and attribution is looking at who hacks and why and what they do. Uh, and that covers things like the hacker profiling project, which you might have heard of. It covers things like um, sociological analyses, uh, motivation, psychology, that sort of thing. Um, what hasn't really been done before is trying to compare behavioral profiles of attackers. Um, and to do that, you can use something called case linkage analysis. Case linkage analysis is uh, an academic technique, predominantly. It's not used that much in the real world. Um, and essentially, it's trying to link together separate crimes to a common offender. So um, it's not behavioral profiling, or sorry, offender profiling. Offender profiling is looking at a crime and trying to kind of infer something about the offender who might have committed it based on the features of the crime. Uh, case linkage analysis is about taking um, two crimes and looking at how similar they are and using that to infer whether or not they were done by the same offender, uh, regardless of who that offender might be. So it's been used with some success um, in kind of academic literature, particularly with things like burglary, um, arson, robbery, homicide, that sort of thing. Um, and an example of kind of how granular you get with real world crimes would be with burglary, for instance, you would look at things like entry behaviors. So how did the burglar uh, get into the front door, for example? Or did they get into the front door? Did they use a crowbar? Did they use a screwdriver? Where on the door did they use it? Um, then once they're in the property, what sort of property did they take? Um, and so on. And you would kind of do that for every single possible element of the crime. So you end up with a very, very fine-grained um, kind of description of the features of that crime. And it's based on, case linkage analysis is based on those same principles of uh, distinctiveness and consistency in uh, personality psychology. So in terms of applying this to, uh, to cyber attacks, um, you could, for instance, log keystrokes on a honeypot. So um, attackers uh, keystrokes on a honeypot, take very kind of granular behaviors from those keystrokes um, and compare pairs of offenses. Um, so every possible pair of offenses that you've got to see whether or not they might have been committed by the same attacker. To um, determine the degree of similarity, there are various things you can do. Um, 
first calculate a similarity coefficient, um, then uh, do logistic regression, and then something called receiver operating characteristic curves. And I'll, I'll explain what all of these are. Um, in the forensic linguistics part of this talk, I didn't go into too much detail around kind of the maths and the statistics. Um, I'll focus on it a bit more in this bit because it's a, a little bit easier to, to get to grips with. So in terms of classification, once you've got all these keystrokes, for instance, from a honeypot, what you might do is uh, define some behavioral buckets. So uh, you might have navigation behaviors or enumeration behaviors, which loosely tie into uh, real world crimes, entry behaviors and property stolen behaviors and things like that. You divide those keystrokes into commands and you turn them into yes or no questions. So you say things like, did the attacker try to use wget to download malware? Did they use ls-lah or did they use dash la or did they use dash l? Um, and so on and so on. And you just assign a one if it's a yes and zero if it's a no. And you end up with a binary string for each offense in each of, that, each of those behavioral buckets. You then um, calculate something called a similarity coefficient. In this case, it's Jacquard's coefficient, which is just a very kind of crude measure of similarity. Um, and essentially, you calculate three variables, um, the behaviors that are present in both of the attacks you're looking at, um, behaviors present in attack A but not attack B, and then behaviors present in B but not A. There's no kind of um, analysis of joint non-occurrence. Um, and you end up, you put it through this formula in the top right, and you end up with a, a figure um, that will be somewhere between zero and one. If it is a one, it means the, the crimes are perfectly similar, so they're identical in every feature. Zero means they're perfectly dissimilar, so they're completely uh, opposite, essentially. You then put these coefficients into a logistic regression model. Um, now, if you don't uh, have like a statistics background, um, which I don't, um, then things like logistic regression can kind of seem a bit um, uh, intimidating, but uh, actually you can use something like SPSS or R, which are both statistics packages. I mentioned R a bit uh, earlier on. There's loads of tutorials online and tutorial videos on how to use these things. Uh, logistic regression isn't that bad uh, once you've done it a few times. And essentially why you want to do logistic regression is just puts a bit more rigor around how similar um, two crimes might be. You run that for each of your behavioral buckets and you end up with a positive or negative correlation and something called a p-value, which just shows you how uh, statistically significant um, the, uh, the match is. And then you can repeat that with something called forward stepwise logistic regression, um, which is essentially kind of machine learning. So you start off with one domain and you add one at each step and see if it contributes to the power of the um, uh, predictive power of the model. Uh, and if it does, you keep it, otherwise you... Um, discard it. Now when I say discard, important to note um, that because we're potentially talking about like evidential stuff, it doesn't mean you just throw the data away, it's purely talking about the predictive power of the model. And then you can put those regression results into rock curves and this is just an extra level of kind of statistical rigor. Um, rock curves uh, basically plot uh, the probability of a false positive against the probability of a true positive. And it's just a more reliable measure of predictive accuracy. You end up with something called an area under the curve or an AUC value. Uh, and an AUC value looks like this graphically, or rock curves look like this. So um, the higher that AUC value, the greater the level of predictive accuracy you've got. 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 is low, 0 0.7 to 0 0.9 is good, and uh, 0.9 to 1 is, uh, is very high. So um, I ran an experiment on this um, to see uh, if this could work. So case linkage analysis had previously been applied to uh, real world offenses, but never before to, um, to cyber attacks, to kind of online attacks. So I took uh, an open source Python SSH keylogger um, that uses strace to log keystrokes, uh, modified it a bit, um, and then I set up uh, two virtual machines, uh, exposed them on the internet over SSH, created 10 accounts per VM, and um, got some uh, uh, volunteers who were pen testers and students, and got them to SSH in as low privilege users. Um, I configured each VM with deliberate privilege escalation vulnerabilities um, and gave them some kind of uh, interesting fake data to exfiltrate. And I asked each of those volunteers to SSH in as that low privilege user, try and get root, try and steal data from the machine however you want, try and cover your tracks to some extent, uh, and generally just kind of poke around the file system. So by the, uh, the time they'd done that, I ended up with um, uh, attack pairs, and what I wanted to see was whether I could uh, link together those attacks which had been committed by the same volunteer. So uh, lots of keystrokes um, collated, 
and split those into the behavioral buckets. Um, so I had three, navigation, enumeration, exploitation. So navigation is about kind of how the attacker moves through the file system. Enumeration is about um, how they discover more about the environment they're on. And then exploitation covers everything from attempts to escalate privileges um, through to you know, downloading malware, exfiltrating data, and that sort of thing. Ended up with kind of 40 of those yes or no questions per behavioral bucket. And here's a, a sample of some of them. Um, so you can see there are, uh, it's not, it's much more granular than just saying something like, did the attacker use sudo? Instead, you've got, you know, did they do sudo command or did they do sudo username or did they do sudo su? Um, it's not just did they use chmod, it's if they use chmod, what, what number did they try and use or did they do plus x? Um, and, you know, that kind of thing. So, an example of kind of how granular it is. Um, I then uh, calculated the jacquard values. Um, I did it in an automated fashion, and you could see you could, um, you know, if you don't have a lot of time or you're not kind of comfortable with the um, statistics element, you could just rely just on the jacquard values because you can see that the mean average of these jacquard values for the linked offenses is much higher than the jacquard value for the unlinked offenses. Um, so you've got 0.756 for, for linked offenses using the navigation bucket, um, but for unlinked offenses in the same bucket is 0.16, um, so it's so much lower. But you can add that kind of extra degree of rigor um, and do logistic regression and rock curves. And uh, these are the um, AUC values uh, in the second column along. Um, and you can see that in terms of predictive accuracy, um, depending on which behavioral bucket you're focusing on, um, the accuracy ranges from uh, 0.91 to 0.99, um, which is, is pretty high. Um, so um, pretty kind of promising experiment. In terms of practically applying this, um, you could run uh, honeypots or something like that, and you could have um, some form of keylogger on those honeypots to kind of build up a corpus of attack profiles. Um, potentially, you could identify attackers who've trained together as well or have done kind of similar certifications, that sort of thing. There are some caveats with this, both with um, case linkage generally and with this particular experiment. So with CLA generally, um, some offenders will be more consistent and more distinctive than other offenders. Um, MO is a learned behavior, so some offenders will learn, they'll develop as their kind of careers go on. They'll learn from other people, um, they'll learn by getting caught in some cases. Um, and sometimes offenders will change their behaviors in response to events as well. Um, and then with this experiment, obviously it was a very small sample, so only kind of 10 volunteers. Um, it was only looking at one scenario, um, so only kind of one operating system, low priv to high priv. Um, the volunteers weren't real attackers, um, so they, they knew they weren't going to get caught. They knew it was an academic experiment. Um, and not all attackers will, will, will need or want to kind of escalate privileges to root either. And again, not 100% accurate, so again, it's not a silver bullet, um, but hopefully you'll agree it's, uh, it's potentially interesting. So in terms of privacy implications, similar to forensic linguistics, uh, the implication is that you can potentially be linked to separate hosts or identities, um, and you may not want to, depending on your uh, individual circumstances. Um, and that's regardless of like anonymizing measures and, and OPSEC uh, measures that you're taking, you could potentially be linked to either historical or future activity. In terms of countermeasures then, similar to defeating uh, authorship attribution, you can make a conscious decision to try and disguise the commands you use or your kind of strategies when you're on a system and you're typing commands. Um, so it's hard to automate potentially um, because you can't necessarily predict what commands you're going to need to enter in advance, but you could maybe semi-automate it. You could have a script that maybe randomizes the orders of command switches, something like that. Uh, you could switch up the tools you use. So you could use wget instead of curl, depending on the use case. You could use vi instead of nano, although that might start a war. Um, so uh, yeah, different kind of tools you could use. So in terms of what you can do now, you can give this a go. Um, so you could set up a capture the flag machine, uh, obviously kind of make sure that people um, attacking it are aware of what you're doing, but you could have a keylogger running on that CTF machine, um, classify and calculate the jacquard scores, which is very simple to do, is you could automate it pretty easily. Uh, calculate logistic regression um, scores, again, pretty simple, kind of once you're familiar with, with something like SPSS or R, um, and then calculate the rock curves, um, again, using the same tools. Um, so you could try and make it a bit more scalable and automate it with R or Python or something like that. Um, you could look at other behavioral domains. So I only looked at those three, navigation, enumeration, exploitation, but you could kind of look at evasion as well. So what techniques uh, an attacker takes to try and cover their tracks. 
Um, so um, there is a white paper available for this. If you want more detail, um, give me a shout. Uh, I'll put my contact details up a bit later. Um, or I uh, spoke on this at DEF CON last year. So there's a talk on YouTube that goes into kind of more detail about it. Okay, uh, we'll move on to um, cultural captures, which is the, the last side channel we're gonna talk about. Um, out of interest, does anybody get this reference? Hands up if you kind of understand this reference. Okay, some of the, uh, the uh, audience interaction in this section might fall flat, we'll see. Um, so, um, a really kind of interesting problem in, uh, in social media and in security is determining whether or not a social media account is run by a human or a bot. And it's a very kind of active research area. There's been lots of stuff done on it, both academically and practically. Uh, there are lots of paid or free services out there that will kind of take a, a Twitter handle, for example, as an input, and will, um, based on like an analysis of the behaviors and features of that account, um, give you kind of a percentage probability of how likely it is that account is run by a human or not. Um, a much harder question is, is an account uh, actually from where it says it's from? And the context of that, the reason why that's important, is if you have kind of hostile social media accounts that are attempting to uh, influence uh, consensus or conversations around perhaps particularly um, sensitive political topics in a particular country. Uh, Brexit would be a, a key example in the UK. Um, political elections would be a key one in the US. Um, if you have an account, let's stick with the UK example, um, that claims to be from the UK and is um, uh, trying to kind of manipulate consensus or kind of contribute strongly to debates on Brexit, um, is that account actually from the UK or could it be from somewhere else um, for, for whatever reason? So this is where cultural captures comes in, the concept of cultural captures. It's a, a term that I've coined to try and describe uh, cultural artifacts that for whatever reason haven't really uh, spread beyond their country of origin. Um, in many cases, that's uh, popular culture. It's things like TV shows and, um, and things like that, maybe kind of country-specific memes. But it can also be things like language or cultural norms or kind of food or traditions, that kind of thing. So um, I want to try and run an experiment. As I said, this might fall flat if we don't have people from the UK uh, in the room. But um, if you know who these two are, can you uh, put your hand up? OK. Uh, and. If you um, are from the UK or you spent like a significant amount of time in the UK, say kind of five to 10 years, um, put your hand down. Is there anybody with a hand still up? Okay, not that I can see. Okay, interesting. So um, these two are uh, British TV entertainers, uh, a children's kind of comedy show, they were anyway. Um, and uh, it's very specific to the UK. So these guys never kind of made it to, to any other countries. They weren't kind of broadcast in Europe or anything like that. Um, so it's an example of a kind of country-specific cultural reference. Here's another example. Um, again, this is a UK one. So uh, if you know the answer to this, put your hand up and, and keep up for me. Any idea who's on the? Yeah. And then if you're um, from the UK, you spent a significant amount of time in the UK, put your hand back down. OK. So one or two with a hand still. Okay, interesting, all right. I wanna try one, uh, so yeah, the reason why I kind of modified this image a little bit um, as opposed to this one is to try and kind of style me just reverse image searching to find the answer. So if you take the original photo, um, you can see that Google kind of finds that, um, uh, suggests who this is. So I didn't type this into the search bar, Google did that automatically, uh, produces a lot of results and would kind of give away the answer. With the manipulated version, uh, you can see there's kind of two results and neither of them are, are relevant to the answer. Let's try one for the Americans in the audience. Hopefully this might um, go a bit better. So um, if you know who this guy is um, and where he's from, hands up. Okay, and if you're from the States, you spent a significant amount of time in the States, put your hand back down. Okay, yes, it worked, all right. So um, this is an interesting one. I wanted to try this one out because this was a, a meme uh, in 2011 and I kind of wanted to see whether um, it was like a country specific meme or whether it kind of spread um, beyond the state. So this is uh, Jake from State Farm. Um, that's the, the kind of answer. Um, I didn't know that. I don't even know what State Farm is. Um, so yeah, an example. Well, it might just be my own ignorance. I don't know. Um, here's uh, another example. Now, um, this is a really interesting one. So if you've seen the film Inglorious Bastards, you'll be familiar with this example. Um, if you're not, 
What's happening here is that uh, Michael Fassbender on the, on the right is a British officer who's gone undercover in France as a Nazi officer, and he's trying to avoid detection. He's just signaled to the barman that he wants three glasses. Um, the reason that the woman on the left is looking at his hand like that um, is because she's German, and she knows that in Germany, to signal three uh, is your first two fingers and your thumb. Um, so he's kind of just giving himself away. So an example there that's not necessarily popular culture, um, but more of a kind of cultural quirk. Um, there are kind of examples uh, in food. So Royale with cheese is a good example, or kind of French fries with, um, with mayonnaise instead of ketchup and that sort of thing. Um, so this kind of concept of cultural captures, it's a lot less well-formed than the forensic linguistics or the behavioral signatures because they both kind of have an empirical base and they've been uh, tried and tested to some extent. This is a bit more out there. Um, it's kind of um, more of a suggestion for something that, that might work. Um, and I, I kind of want to take you through a case study here of how this could be used in practice. Uh, so this isn't something I created. Um, this is um, something that someone else tried on Twitter. And it deals with a specific account um, that, is, uh, that claims to be British and that is very vocal in uh, pro-Brexit arguments on Twitter. And if you um, use one of those services I mentioned earlier to try and work out is this account human or a bot, um, it's one of these services kind of concludes that actually it probably is run by a human, it's not run by a bot. So how could we kind of tell if this account is actually from the UK or not? Uh, and this is the test um, that this person uh, ran with this account on Twitter. Does anyone know the answer to this, incidentally? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, so these are uh, screenshots from this uh, conversation on Twitter. So um, the person who posted the question, uh, this question here, is the um, account uh, here, the kind of brown colored um, profile picture. And the person they were targeting is the blue colored profile picture here um, with the, the Chelsea flag. You might be able to see that. Um, so uh, the, the challenger, if you like, the person who posted this question, um, kind of says that, you know, you can't answer this question. You don't know the answer you're claiming to be from the UK. Um, and uh, I apologize in advance for the, the language um, that this, uh, this other account uses, but you can see that they become uh, increasingly hostile. Um, other people kind of jump in and um, say to them, you know, if you're from the UK, you should know who this person is, kind of on the balance of probabilities. And, and one thing that the account might have said to try and, I guess, save themselves, they could say, you know, I, I don't watch much TV, I've got no idea. But you can see at the bottom on the left, they say, I know who both these people are, I'm just not telling you who they are, um, which is interesting. So in terms of kind of practically using this, and again, further research would be needed to kind of determine if this is actually a viable, feasible approach, but you could use it as some kind of verification system, maybe for accounts that have been reported as being possibly kind of false or suspicious or hostile. Um, there is kind of the caveat that users genuinely might not know the answer, um, like, like real captures. Um, so you could kind of give users the option to select a different one. Um, so a really kind of crude example uh, of how this could work. I, I'm not a developer, so this is um, shockingly bad coding. Um, but just an example is you could try and kind of protect a resource um, by having someone or forcing them to kind of try and answer a question. Um, and if they type in something incorrect, they don't get access to it. If they type in the correct answer, then they eventually do get access to it. So caveats with this potential approach is that it does rely on, on very specific cultural knowledge, uh, some of which may be age dependent. Um, so the, the first example I showed you of those two uh, children's entertainers, um, they were kind of active in the 90s mostly. Um, so that's going to be kind of an age dependent thing. In an increasingly kind of connected world, it might be uh, increasingly difficult to try and find resilient examples for this. There's also the case that users may generally not know the answer. Um, perhaps they um, either don't want to watch much you know, TV if it's a TV question or they haven't had access to a TV. Um, and as mentioned before, there's the kind of reverse image search thing as well. So in terms of what you can do with this now, um, it would be really cool to see if this uh, actually could be effective at scale and could be feasible. Um, so if anybody kind of wants to discuss coming up with their own examples maybe or implementations, testing it on social media even against, um, against some accounts, um, not necessarily kind of ones you think are hostile, but just generally to get a sense of um, how effective it would be. Um, 
and a potentially kind of really interesting area for future um, research in this area uh, would be with kind of click farm workers and catfish accounts and that kind of thing, how much research and, and kind of background knowledge do they, um, do they try and kind of study about the culture and the language that they're trying to, to imitate? Um, I don't know how much data would be available to try and investigate that, but it, I think it's a, a potentially a fascinating area of research. Okay, um, so I am going to wrap up now with some key takeaways. So um, the three human side channels that I've talked you through today, forensic linguistics, behavioral signatures, and cultural captures, potentially offer um, pretty underexplored and unconventional methods for attribution and defense that can actually be quite cost effective. Um, they are they are often considered uh, very specialist and niche areas, but um, hopefully you've seen the barrier to entry isn't necessarily that high, and there are kind of tools you can download and play with pretty much straight away to get a sense of uh, whether it might be useful to you in your um, in your day jobs. Um, so in terms of future research, um, it would be really cool to see if those proof of concepts, particularly the behavioral signatures, could be kind of expanded um, to look into other human side channels. Um, looking at the cultural captures thing, whether that could be expanded to be a kind of viable solution, um, looking into kind of how applicable forensic linguistics might be as an investigative tool um, to automate some of this stuff, especially the forensic linguistics and the behavioral signature stuff. Um, and if you're interested in chatting about this or um, there's anything from this talk that you want me to kind of go over or discuss in more detail, I'm more than happy to do that. So that's my email address and my Twitter handle. I've got open DMs if you want to uh, DM instead. Um, or if you've got kind of any thoughts or feedback about the talk, it would be uh, great to hear from you. So um, this is just a review of the aims from the start of the talk. Hopefully you agree with uh, most of these. So um, be aware of three human side channels and how they work. Give you some practical takeaways, including tools, uh, examine the security and privacy implications, uh, possible countermeasures, and uh, future ideas for research as well. So just a quick plug from me that if you're interested in this concept of uh, biocomputers and kind of bio-digital crossovers, I'm speaking at DEF CON on Sunday, 1 p.m. in track two, um, on acoustic cyber weapons, um, which is um, uh, kind of related to this talk, but with a, a very different kind of use case and, um, and focus. So um, I'm going to take you questions in uh, Reef A, which is the wrap room, uh, which is just down the hall. Um, again, contact details up there. Um, as promised, uh, all the references um, cited in this slide deck are here. Uh, if you fancy some summer reading, um, I'm nothing if not thorough with references. Um, so um, I think uh, that's pretty much it for me. And yeah, thank you very much for your time.